Hello everyone. For this video, we're going to be talking about catecholamine synthesis and catabolism. Now this topic is very high yield because we can see just from one pathway, there are many different enzymes that are involved and deficiencies in these enzymes can actually lead to pathologies. So why don't we first start off with our starting amino acid, which is going to be phenylalanine. Now phenylalanine is going to get hydroxylated, meaning that an OH group is going to be added which makes sense because the enzyme that does this is phenylalanine hydroxylase. And it should also be noted that BH4 is going to be paired with this hydroxylase, so this is an important cofactor. Next, we're going to have the formation of tyrosine as a result. Now tyrosine it can also be hydroxylated using tyrosine hydroxylase and BH4 to form DOBA, or tyrosine with the addition of iodine can go on to form thyroxine, which is a very important hormone that is released by the thyroid. We can also later see that tyrosine can be degraded into homogentistic acid. Now homogentistic acid can later be degraded further into acetoacetate using the enzyme homogentistic acid oxidase, or it can be degraded into fumarate using the same enzyme. Now fumarate, as we can see, can then enter the TCA cycle and then enter to become glucose. So therefore, it makes sense that since acetoacetate is a ketone, and also we have glucose, that tyrosine is both a ketogenic and a glucogenic amino acid. And since phenylalanine formed this uh, ty 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 tyrosine as well, we know that phenylalanine will also be ketogenic and glucogenic as well. Now, what, now if we go further on into the pathway, once we form, form DOPA as a result of that hydroxylation previously discussed, we can see that DOPA can actually be degraded, I'm sorry, not degraded, actually be converted into melanin using the enzyme tyrosinase. Furthermore, we can see that DOPA can be converted into dopamine using an enzyme called DOPA decarboxylase, which makes sense because we're going to be removing a carboxyl group from DOPA to form dopamine. Now this uses cofactor B6, which is also important. Now dopamine can be degraded into homovanillic acid, which is eventually going to be excreted into the urine using monoamine oxidase, or COMT. Now these can occur and reverse, reverse as well, so it can be MAO followed by COMT or COMT followed by MAO. Now next, if it, is, if it does not get degraded, dopamine will be converted into norepinephrine using the enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase, which, as you guessed it, is going to be a hydroxylation reaction that's going to occur. Now vitamin C is also an important cofactor to make note of. Next we have norepinephrine that is going to be converted into epinephrine using the enzyme PNMT. And an important cofactor is S methionine. Now we can see here we have quite a bit going on in terms of its deg degradation. But the main thing we need to know is that the end product that's going to be excreted in the urine along with homovanillic acid is vanillyl mandelic acid. There's just two separate paths that can occur here. So as we can see, if we use COMT first, we're going to form an intermediate called metanephrine and normetanephrine. If we use MAO first, we're going to be creating an intermediate called dihydroxymandelic acid. Now after these intermediates are formed accordingly, we're all going to form vanillyl mandelic acid using the enzyme that had not been used yet, whether it's MAO or COMT. Lastly, we can also point out that uh, cortisol will actually activate beta hydroxylate, do dopamine beta uh, hydroxylase or induce it. And carbidopa will inhibit dopa de decarboxylase. Now, why don't we talk about the clinical correlations that we see with each of these enzymes I just discussed as what's going to occur when there's deficiencies in these enzymes. So the first thing we can talk about is actually going to be PKU. With PKU, we can see there's going to be deficiencies of phenyl phenylalanine hydroxylase. So if we think about what if we block right here, then we can obviously see that 
there's going to be an increase in the levels of phenylalanine. When phenylalanine increases, what's going to happen is that there's actually going to be a uh, a increase in acetoacetate that's going to occur because it has no way because it's not being converted down the pathway so you're going to have an increase so therefore majority of the phenylalanine is going to be shunted out into this pathway as a result so therefore you can have an increase in acetoacetate which is actually quite toxic and is what's going to cause some of the problems that we see in children that are born with PKU and some of these things include uh, growth growth issues and also uh, a decrease in IQ. Now also if you think about what's going to happen if we block it, the pathway over here, it makes sense that we're going to have a decrease in the products at the end of the pathway such as decreased epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin and dopamine as well. Now if we think back to our endocrine unit, it makes sense that if there's going to be a decrease in dopamine and there's going to be an increase in prolactin because we know that dopamine levels are the ones that are going to inhibit those prolactin levels. Now the next pathology we can talk about is what's going to occur in alcaptinuria. Now with alcaptinuria, there's going to be a deficiency in homogen tisic acid oxidase. So because of this deficiency, there's actually going to be an increase in homogen tisic acid. So what's going to cause? So what's that going to cause? Well, there's actually going to be a buildup of this as what we would expect and therefore this buildup is going to occur in things such as the connective tissue and it can actually uh, uh, be excreted into the urine as well and what we can see is that after a urine has been set for a period of time out, out, out in the air it, could, it will turn from yellow to black which is pretty interesting and also we can see that the connective tissue in which the homogenetic acid uh, builds up in also turns black and lastly this can lead to very severe uh, arth arthritis as well. Now lastly, the next pathology we need to talk about is what's going to occur with the deficiency of the tyrosinase enzyme. With this enzyme, if it's deficient, we're going to be lead to albinism. Now there's two types of albinism that can occur. So we're going to have oculocutaneous 1 and oculocutaneous 2. Now with oculocutaneous 1, it's just going to be a deficiency in this enzyme, tyrosinase, which is the most common. The second one we have is OCA2, which is not going to be a deficiency in tyrosinase, but actually the, a deficiency in the ty tyrosine receptor. This is, this is seen in chediak higashi syndrome, where what actually occurs is since there's a deficiency in, since, since the microtubules are not working correctly, you're not able to transport these receptors. So that's why we see this in um, Chediak-Higashi syndrome. And also because of this al al albinism, patients are going to be usually very pale skin. They're going to have uh, blue eyes and blonde hair, and they're going to be more susceptible to skin cancers and sunburns. So that pretty much sums up the, this video. If you have any questions, please post them. And like always, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you and good luck studying.